Hello and welcome to the Doc Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike DeLuke, and it's my mission to help you lead a happier, healthier, and more prosperous life, both personally and professionally. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to today's episode of the Doc Podcast. Today's episode is the second of a two-part series on the paradigm shift and our approach to interceptive treatment. And today we will focus on the treatment of the etiology. As I mentioned at the end of the previous podcast, those of you who are consuming our content on an audio-only platform may want to also watch it on YouTube or Rumble or uh, Locals, since I will be showing a significant number of images throughout the episode. I will do my best to describe what I'm showing for those of you who are unable to watch the video. Let's quickly review where we left off in the last podcast. We had our just about to turn eight-year-old patient, and after performing an initial very cursory exam, we diagnosed her with a class one malocclusion, narrow V-shaped arches, a high vaulted palate, and moderate crowding. But then we talked about the importance of doing a deeper dive into the presenting condition, and we uncovered tired eyes, allergic shiners, Denny Morgan lines, an allergic crease in the nose, chapped lips, chapped gums, altered passive eruption in the maxillary anterior sextant, plaque accumulation on the gingival margins anteriorly, the steep curve of Wilson, insufficient space for the tongue, obstruction of the nasal passageways secondary to turbinate hypertrophy, underdevelopment of the right maxillary sinus, and enlarged adenoids obstructing the nasal pharynx, large adenoids obstructing the nasal pharynx and a posteriorly positioned tongue obstructing the oropharynx. So you can see by doing a deeper dive, we found out a lot more information than just taking a cursory exam, looking at the patient as we so often do for this age group. So now that we know the etiology of the malocclusion and we know it's a transverse discrepancy secondary to mouth breathing and snoring, we can develop a treatment plan to address it. The traditional way to address a transverse discrepancy is with a hyrax type expander. But is that really the best way to address it? Let's take a look at the history of rapid maxillary expansion and see if that can help us determine if that is, in fact, the best treatment approach. So orthopedic expansion of the maxilla has been performed since, some of you may know this year, 1860, when E.C. Engel, not Engel, reported, first reported the procedure. It was popularized in the mid-1960s and has gone through exacerbations where there's periods of popularity and decline since that time. The concept is that it applies enough force to the teeth and the maxillary alveolar process to exceed the limit needed for orthodontic tooth movement in an effort to minimize the dental movement and maximize the skeletal movement. Isaacson and Ingram in 1964 reported that a single activation of a jack screw appliance produces forces in the 3 to 10 pound range. Multiple daily activations can result in cumulative loads of 20 pounds or more. Multiple studies have found that this force actually causes numerous side effects, including gingival resection, recession, exostoses, pulp stones, root resorption, and buckle tipping. Histology of sutural tissues after RME shows free-floating bone fragments and numerous microfractures, cyst-like formations, inflammatory tissue, and a rapid dystrophic ossification with immature bone tissue. Prophet, in his classic text, Contemporary Orthodontics, stated that RPE can be a disadvantage in young children as it can cause facial distortion. You also need to overexpand by at least two to three millimeters, millimeters to account for the relapse that occurs in retention as a result of the unbending and recoil of the alveolar process. So I'm certainly not anti-expander. I've used them thousands of times. It would be hypocritical to, to say that if I were to say, to, to say that they don't work and they don't have their place. The question is, is it necessary at the age group we're talking about treating to use that magnitude of force. And when we talk about that, it's also important to understand that expanders come with their fair share of issues. I placed thousands of them on young kids in phase one early in my career, as that's how I initially dealt with transverse issues at that time. But they can be clinically challenging. And especially, I mean, when you try to place these things on some of these young kids with teeny miles, it can be brutal on you and on them. They also created these wide V-shaped arches with excessive expansion across the posterior third and insufficient expansion across the middle and anterior thirds of the arch. And ironically, that's typically where the issue we're trying to solve in these patients lies. 
I also found that maxillary canines were often getting impacted even after expansion. And this was beyond frustrating, especially because we told the patients and when you tell the patient to the parents that now after the first phase, they're likely going to have to have maxillary bicuspids extracted and potentially even surgical exposure of one or more canines, it doesn't exactly go over well, especially after they've invested the time, energy, and expense going through interceptive treatment. And if you've been practicing long enough and done enough expansion in phase one with Hyrax type expanders, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Expanders move the teeth en masse, so it's really hard to titrate for more or less correction in specific areas of the arch. Patients, parents, and clinicians really don't like expanders because of all the issues they create. On the screen, I'm going to put a slide of 25 common issues we see with expanders. For those in audio, I'll just review a few of them so you can get the gist of it. I'll also be showing some pictures of, of the actual issues that occur intraorally. So things such as ill-fitting appliances that have to be remade, gagging patients, a huge midline diastema, tongue ulcerations, palatal impingement of the arms and solder joints of the appliance, palatal ulcerations when the appliance is removed, loose bands loosening during treatment, the expander key unturning, requiring it to be removed and remade, parents overturning the appliance and causing overexpansion, and so on and so on. Again, the list is extensive, and I'm sure there are some out there. You can shoot me an email and let me know if I'm missing some, but uh, these are just some of the, the most common ones that I've encountered, and these aren't isolated one-offs. These are things that are encountered routinely. Uh, if you're doing a lot of expanders, especially in phase one, you won't go a day without seeing multiple of these, of these issues in your practice. And then about, and with mandibular expansion, Sometimes you have cases where both arches are narrow. And I never understood, and we didn't talk a lot uh, in my training about what to do with the mandibular arch. The reason for that is we really didn't treat a lot of phase one patients, and most residents don't. It's just kind of the nature of the system, right? A lot of times uh, we're treating patients who are on state funding. Uh, the, the Salzman index, which is what is used for coverage, doesn't include the primary teeth when you're talking about just crowding unless there's a posterior crossbite. So unless a patient presented with a, a unilateral or bilateral posterior crossbite, you really didn't go in there and proactively treat these patients in phase one. So I don't know if that's why academia doesn't have the philosophy that this is an acceptable approach just because they don't really have access to doing it. Uh, I'm not, again, kind of a chicken and the egg argument there, uh, or if it's just that they're against doing it and not in favor of this approach, so they don't look for opportunities to do it. Again, I'm not sure. I just know that most residencies across the U.S. do not have extensive interceptive treatment training for their residents. So when I got out into practice, I, I started realizing, well, geez, a lot of these arches, the lower arch is narrow, the upper arch is narrow. They may not have a posterior crossbite. But much like in the patient of the case we've been showing you, she didn't have a posterior crossbite, but she certainly had a transverse discrepancy. Uh, another way to think of it was, is if her lower arch weren't narrow, that patient would have a posterior crossbite because it's clear that her maxilla is narrow and she has a high vaulted palate. So what do we do about the lower arch? I researched this a lot when I first came out 20 year, of my residency almost 20 years ago, trying to figure out what I could do about this. And so some of you have heard about a Schwartz plate. So a Schwartz plate is essentially a holly with kind of a hyrax, a lower holly, with a hyrax screw anteriorly. And I tried a few of these, but I found compliance was terrible because patients just didn't like the pressure that they exerted. So what they would do is they'd take it out of their mouth to turn it because they didn't like the feeling of it, the pressure when they would turn it or their parent would turn it in their mouth. So the kid would be like, oh, I can turn it. They'd take it out, turn it, and go to put it back in. Well, what happened when they go to put it back in? Well, of course, it's wider than when they had it in before. So it doesn't, if they push it down all the way, it puts pressure. And that pressure didn't feel good. So what did they do? They didn't put it down all the, push it down all the way. So the kids would come in. I do a, a, a check. And, and just so I'm clear, with lower expansion, you're not turning this once or twice a day. You're turning it once a week um, or every five to seven days, depending on your protocol, because you're just trying to get dental tipping. You obviously can't skeletally expand the mandibular arch. Uh, the symphysis is fused at birth, at, around the time of birth, uh, the midline symphysis. So you, you're not trying to get skeletal expansion, but you don't need it because the bone the bone base and the body of the mandible uh, is typically plenty wide. It's the teeth that are all caved in. So we're just trying to get dental movement to decompensate uh, the, the uh, tipping that has occurred. When we do that, 
you find that you actually can get an amazing result, but the patient, as I said, has to tolerate this appliance. And if they don't, and when they come in and they're like, yeah, you're fitting great. And, you, and they open their mouth, things falling out. Mom's like, oh yeah, it falls out in their sleep all the time. I think something's wrong with the appliance. It doesn't work. It doesn't stay in. Well, it's because it didn't, they, they weren't pushing it down. So you're in the clinic, unturning it, trying to titrate it back to where you can get it just right, saying, go ahead, okay, Johnny, go ahead, try again. And they would try again. And what would happen? They'd come back in a few weeks later and it would be the same thing again. So I quick, quickly realized not only was this horribly inefficient and ineffective, it also wasn't much of a practice builder. Uh, so I switched to what's called a Williams Expander, which is a fixed Hyrax type appliance. Uh, it works. I found it worked better than the Schwartz, but it also had additional issues. So again, for those who aren't watching video, you can kind of picture a, a Hyrax with the screw anterior. You can look up online what a Williams is um, at another point, and you see the bars extending hooking off the molars posteriorly, almost kind of like a, a lingual arch with an expansion key anteriorly. But I, what happened with these is they caused, when they worked, they could work, but they caused tongue ulcerations and the tongue would get under the appliance and lift it up and submerge, sink the distals of the posterior teeth. Food would get caught under it. And I dealt with constant pay, uh, extra care visit calls with food under the lingual bars because it was such a big solder joint down there uh, to keep the rigidity of the, uh, of the appliance. That food would get caught. There'd be ulcerations. If the patient starts to lose a primary tooth while you're expanding or they lose a primary tooth and the permanent tooth is erupting under the, the metal and you're trying to cut the metal out. Uh, I mean, just I could go on and on about the issues I faced and endured. And, and like I said, I did thousands of these. I also found that it created a very wide V-shaped arch, which was overexpanded posteriorly and underexpanded anteriorly, just like we talked about in the upper. And this is an important point. If you look at the crowding in patients such as the one we've been discussing, the crowding is primarily in the anterior and middle thirds of the arch. Now, as an aside, if you want um, this patient we've been discussing well, on the doc website, theorthocoach.com, if you go to the free courses, her course is one, is on there uh, as, as course two, and it actually, or her course, her case is on there as part of course two, uh, and there's three parts to it on there, uh, and you can go ahead and watch that as well, and it'll be some duplicative information of what we're reviewing in the podcast, uh, but it's also a nice way to, to really get a good view of those images and uh, a workup of that case. So another way that we can tell that this is less genetic and more environmental is it's when the patient opens their mouth due to mouth breathing, right, and snoring, that, as we talked about, stretches the buccinators and puts the inward pressure and stresses on the anterior and middle thirds of the arch, which constricts the transverse growth in these areas. We then see this very V-shaped arch. And that V-shaped arch squishes the tongue, which as we talked about, due to the diet being softer, is weaker already. And that tongue is just easily pushed posteriorly where it restricts the airway. It makes it so that the air can't come in through and down into the oropharynx. It's obstructed by the, posterior, by the tongue being positioned posteriorly. The patient continues to mouth breathe and it keeps putting pressure on those arches to constrict them. So typically in these patients, you see these V-shaped arches. Rarely do you see narrow horseshoe-shaped arches. They're usually V-shaped. Not always, but typically. So if we take this and we put a turnkey expander in or a Hyrax type expander in on a patient with these V-shaped arches, what you end up getting is really wide Vs. So they're overexpanded posteriorly where they needed little to no expansion and they're underexpanded anteriorly where they needed the expansion, right? And don't we know this because as we go back to what we talked about at the beginning of today's episode, isn't that why sometimes we put patients in expansion and we look and their canines still don't have room and they're impacted or they erupt labially and ectopically, right? Or we're sweating it out at their phase one retainer check appointments, like looking at those canines, are they gonna get impacted? Are they going to get impacted? The reason for that has to do with the biomechanics of an expansion, an expander, a turnkey Hyrax type expander. Now you could use, um, there's fan shaped expanders. There's kind of a reverse expansion appliances that are out there. And, and while those have a place, they're talking about speech and discomfort. And, and there's a lot of other issues with them as well. And you still can't titrate them to the same extent. And now you've got a case maybe that needs a little more posterior expansion. 
how do you deal with that if you're getting so much anteriorly and not enough posteriorly? Another big reason why I never loved those types of appliances is what you're actually doing is you're taking the Hyrax and you're putting it more anterior, which is where they're the most narrow. And so you, you, it, it, I mean, it's, it's a, awful for the patient from a speech perspective to try to put this thing up towards the anterior. You can't get it high enough up in the palate and it's really almost kind of at the incisive papilla area or maybe just superior to that. And it's really, really tough for these patients to tolerate. And that's something I think is so important as we talk, that we don't talk about near enough is what would we want in our mouth or in our, our kids' mouths, right? If any of you out there have treated your daughters or my, I've treated my daughters, you treated your kids, right? It, it, it's different when that patient comes home with you and you really can see the impact that your treatment has on them in their everyday lives. So it's so easy for us to just go through the, the procedure as a, as a clinician and be like, see you in eight weeks or whatever the interval we treat is and not realize that that patient has to go live with those changes we make. So we can cram whatever appliance we want in these kids, but is that really what's best for them? Is making them not able to talk in school good for them? Is giving them a lisp, or if they have a lisp, making it worse good for them and for their psychosocial health? Is giving them something else for their friends to make fun of them for, or at that point not friends, but classmates to make fun of them for, a positive thing for them? Is making them feel insecure something we should be proud of and just say, hey, look, this is what you've got to do? Or could we push ourselves to find different approaches, better approaches? to really help these kids that are minimally invasive and maximally effective. If you, uh, there's an article by D'Souza and colleagues that was published in Contemporary Clinical Dentistry in 2015. It studied the amount of gain of arch width and arch perimeter associated with RME. They found that intermolar width increased by 4.4 millimeters, interpremolar width by three, increased by 3.2 millimeters, and intercanine width increased by 2.9 millimeters. So as you can see, it increases more posteriorly and less anteriorly, hence leading to that wide V-shaped arch, because remember, it already started V-shaped. Now we're increasing the V that we see in so many of these RPE cases. In addition, another thing you'll notice in these cases is a lot of the incisors are retroclined in a lot of these cases. Sometimes it's because they had premature exfoliation of their C's because they were so crowded anteriorly. Maybe by the time they came in to see us, the twos had already forced out the C's and it almost becomes like a serial extraction type of approach, right? Where when the C's are extracted, you end up getting incisors that are, that are like this. You have a, a very obtuse interincisal angle. So what's What's really, really ever discussed in phase one is incisor inclination, unless you're dealing with, you know, a class two div two patient with those classic uh, uh, upper two to two, the way they're positioned. But if you stop and look at these patients and you notice those incisors are retroclined, you actually can get tremendous gains in arch perimeter by normalizing, proclining and normalizing those incisors. In a study published in the AJODO in 1991, Jermaine Lindauer, Rubenstein, Revere Jr., and Isaacson found that expansion of the molars and canines along with incisor proclination produces the greatest net gain and arch perimeter. That's an important point. When it was combined versus just looking at incisor proclination, just looking at, at uh, expansion, when you combine the two, you got the greatest net gain and arch perimeter. Well, maybe that's why sometimes if we just put expanders in on patients and don't address the incisor inclination, we still don't have room for the teeth. Interesting to think about. They also found that expansion with rapid palatal expanders with and without accompanying incisor advancement caused deformation of the arch form. And we're going to show some examples of that, but it's so true. And if you think about it, you probably can picture that in your own cases. So the next thing I want to discuss is the, the rate of expansion, the speed of expansion, okay? We so quickly default to uh, anything that says expansion, we think RPE, right? Well, we know, we learned about slow expansion. I mean, going back to dental school, we were making quad helices in, in, in pre-ortho lab. So we know there's other ways to expand besides rapid maxillary expansion with a Hyrax. Why don't we do it? Let's dive a little deeper into that. So does it really matter if the expansion is rapid or if it's slow? So remember, these kids are typically seven to nine, maybe 10 years old, and the mid-palatal suture is not fully interdigitated. Therefore, you don't need those pounds of force that are, given, uh, that are uh, generated by a turnkey expander to achieve actual skeletal expansion in patients in this age group. 
And many don't know this, but Prophet actually said in his textbook, there's no evidence of any advantage of rapid movement and high forces in children. And conversely, there's ample evidence that this can be quote unquote dangerous. He said slow expansion is the preferred approach to maxillary constriction in children with primary and mixed dentitions. It's the prefer slow expansion is the preferred approach for children in the primary and mixed dentitions. So if we go by this, technically, anyone who's putting an RPE in a seven to nine year old patient is essentially putting the patient at risk and not performing the best treatment. And that's an important point to make. The literature don't support throwing RPEs in seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, and turning it with a skeletal force. Now, you could say, Mike, I like using that, but I only turn it once a week. So we're technically doing slow expansion with a, with a hyrax. Okay, fine, right? Then that, that would be different, obviously. I'm talking about the majority of orthodontists who have no problem, no problem throwing hyrax-type expanders, performing rapid maxillary expansion on seven, eight-year-old patients. Maybe they only do it when they have a posterior crossbite but they still do it. And many, many people over the years have said, and much data has been published to show that that's not what should be happening. Bell actually published an article in the AJODO in 1982, where he reported that the rate of mid-palatal suture separation by slow expansion allows a more physiologically tolerable response by the sutural elements than the disruptive nature of rapidly expanding maxillary segments. This then leads to greater stability and less relapse potential. He concluded that evidence supports the treatment rationale of early correction of transverse discrepancies using, wait for it, a slow expansion procedure. Ladner and Mull uh, published an article in AJODO in 1995 where they reported that forces as low as 221 grams are sufficient to achieve expansion in younger preadolescent patients. And we've known this for many decades. In fact, in 1973, Story published a paper in the AJO, which it was named at the time, uh, before it was the AJODO, where he reported that slow expansion allows physiologic sutural adjustments with less traumatic disruption, a greater respiratory reaction, and greater sutural stability than rapid expansion of sutures. So clearly, there's no need to use rapid expansion on patients that are seven to 10 years of age. Further, the research and data clearly substantiate that using to, that amount of force is potentially causing harm to your patients, and providers should strongly consider using lighter forces associated with slow expansion. But the traditional appliances for achieving slow expansion, a W arch, quad helix, expanded lingual arch, expanded TPA, they're quite cumbersome, and they really don't solve many of the aforementioned issues that we talked about with the uh, bonded Hyrax appliances, right? I mean... I actually find them sometimes less desirable in ways because as much as we talked about, it's hard to titrate a, a, a turnkey hyrax, meaning it's kind of an end mass movement, right? You can't say, I want my molars this much more than my premolar or than my uh, primary molars. So my sixes more than my Ds and Es, and I want to move the Cs a little more or less than that. It's really hard to do that with a, with a hot bonded hyrax. It's even harder to really get a titrated, dialed-in overall approach when you're using these these slow expansion appliances. Uh, I always found, you know, when I'm activating a quad helix, and I used them early in my career, it's like, how do I? How much do I widen it? How much more do I widen it than than I want expansion? Uh, are they going to overexpand? It's just really hard to calculate, and I think that's why a lot of people uh, don't go to them as our first line approach. It's just easier to throw in a hyrax uh, at that point. So, this is where. I want you to think outside the box. So what if, just what if, okay, take all your preconceived notions and just suspend them for a moment. The teeth don't know what, what you're doing to them to apply the force, right? They just know the force. What if we bonded braces on the, te on the teeth, all the teeth, including the baby teeth, right? Bonded braces. So instead of using a lingual arch, Pushing from the lingual, we use braces and pull from the buckle. Now you could make the argument, Mike, if you, on the palate, you, know, you can't really make much of an argument there's any difference on the lower because you're either pushing on the, the teeth on the lingual or pulling on them from the buckle. So the lower is kind of a, a done deal as far as what the teeth feel. The upper, you could say, I'll give you, you could say, Mike, if you go on the buckle, you're, you're way below the center of resistance and where the, the line of force application, you're not going to get as much skeletal expansion. Well, if we're talking about a 14-year-old, you're right, but we're not. 
We're talking about seven, eight, nine-year-olds. Okay, very different, very different. We know light expansion and slow expansion, forces of 221 grams, can expand patients in that age group. So what if we use braces and wires, put in thermal nigh ties that deliver that amount of force, and gently expand the arches? Another thing, remember, as we start to broaden the arch, what now has space to move anteriorly and superiorly and can help shape the palate? The tongue. So the tongue helps us out. So we start to create equilibrium and balance and have to, don't have to use as much excessive force and deliver, as Prophet called, dangerous forces to the maxilla. So your typical thermal nigh tie wires deliver 250 to 300 grams of force, which is plenty sufficient to achieve slow skeletal expansion in pre-adolescent patients per the data. And if we use a broader arch form, then maybe it's possible to actually get more expansion in the anterior middle thirds where we need it. So again, that V-shaped arch, instead of getting a wide V, maybe we can start to shape it and make it more like that horseshoe shape we want. And if we do, right, if we do, and we get more space in that anterior middle third, maybe those canines won't get as impacted, won't get impacted as often. Hmm. Something we're going to have to look more into. So I guess the question becomes is, is this possible? Here are two of my patients who presented with very similar malocclusions, just to contrast this. Both were eight years old and both had very narrow V-shaped maxillary arches with high vaulted palates and blocked out maxillary laterals. They look quite similar. The patient on top was treated with RPE and it ended up like this. You can see the arch is deformed as described in the 1991 study by Germain and colleagues that we just referenced, right? Terrible arch form. Uh, the patient on the bottom was treated with arch wire expansion. And it turned out like this. Look at that beautiful arch form that was achieved. I, it never gets old looking at this. And you will see this time and time again if you practice this way. It's amazing. And, and it, it just it never gets old. And speaking of that, let's go back to our patient that we went over in the first uh, part of this series and talked about at the beginning of this podcast. Let's go through and look at how her case played out. So uh, as I said, if you want to go on the, down to the wet doc website and, and download this from the free CE course, you can see this as well, but we're going to abbreviate it here in the podcast. So... Um, I'll put it in the show notes too. I'll, I'll put a link to that in, uh, in the podcast notes. But it goes beyond the scope of the podcast here to cover everything we did in great detail, which is why I have the CE courses on the doc website. And I'll put those in the podcast that are in the notes as well. But I, just to abbreviate her case, um, I do want to also say that when it comes to looking at her turbinate hypertrophy and level of lymphoid tissue obstruction, uh, you get a feel for this as you do it more, okay? This was a case I treated later in, in my time doing this after I'd been doing this for many years with this approach. And what I found was early on, uh, I mean, come, meaning relative to whether you refer these patients to the ENT or allergist when you see these, these issues in the nasal passageway or and or lymphoid tissue. So you get a feel for it. So when I was newer... I referred too much, right? I, I, which I guess we all do, right? And then I, I learned what the ENTs and allergists were, were actually looking for and what they needed to see the patient for. I talked to them. I got on the phone with them. I went to their offices. I picked their brains to learn anything I could about what they wanted to see and what they felt I should be referring to them or what they felt I should go ahead and treat and make room for the teeth and the tongue and expand them intraorally and then see how they responded and then refer if they still had a problem. So it takes time to master this. And in the doc courses that I keep referencing, I do go into this in great detail and show lots of examples to help you learn it. But again, that exceeds the, uh, uh, the, the, the scope of this podcast. But back to our patient. So here she is eight weeks in treatment. Look at the amazing changes in eight weeks. This is with, and at this point, we have only had, this is our first adjustment, 014 thermal nitai for eight weeks. Closed coils for the two blocked out twos. Look at the health of the tissue. The chap lips are improving. The gingiva. I mean, already, just in eight weeks. Now, here she is at her second adjustment, which is four months into treatment, eight weeks from those first pictures. If you look, you'll notice we're actually getting significant space for the maxillary mandibular twos. So we added some open coil spring to increase that space. 
And as I keep referencing, the courses on the DOC website will actually teach you visit by visit how to treat these cases, how to place the brackets, how to adjust them, how to remove them, how to retain these cases. Um, I'll go into all of that in great detail and I'll put the, the, the links in the show notes below. But just to go through quickly for the purpose of the podcast, here now she is eight months into treatment. This actually is the day we bonded the twos. So this first picture is before and now here she is that same visit after we bonded the twos and we dropped down in the wire uh, strength to be able to engage the laterals. Look at that space we got for these teeth in eight months. And this is her, let's see, two, four, six. This is her fourth visit. Tremendous. No RPE checks, no seps, no bands, no recepts, no pain, no discomfort. Um, you'll hear from them at the end of this, uh, in their own words, what this experience was like for the patient and for mom. Um, it was so easy. I think mom even says, set it and forget it. But it's just, you, you know, your parents and your patients will adore you for doing this, not just because of the changes you achieve, but because of how easy it is on these kids. It's The comfort level is just amazing. And, and it blew, actually blew me away how well these young kids tolerate braces. So I, the interview I'm going to show at the end, in, in the courses I referenced, we actually are going to show a lot of interviews with a lot of different patients and parents, and you'll hear just time after time after time um, how much people love this experience. And I can honestly tell you from treating thousands of cases before with turnkey expanders, I don't know I can ever think of a time where a patient or parent was like, oh, we love those expanders. They are just so wonderful. Or uh, Susie comes in and she's, you know, saying, when you tell her she's going to get her expanders out, she's like, oh, really? I love this thing. I mean, not that it never happens and I don't know that it never happened, but I certainly don't remember a time it happened. Whereas I have multiple patients who were like, I don't want my phase one braces off. I love my phase one braces. I have some of them on video in my courses saying that. So uh, and these kids, they don't lie. They're, they're going to tell it like it is. They're not going to, going to sugarcoat it when you ask them about this stuff. So here she is four months later at her debond. So just to kind of summarize what we did with her, 12 months of treatment time, four adjustment visits and that one progress visit to bond her laterals. 12 months of treatment time, five total visits, treatment related visits, four adjustments and a progress bond, half hour appointment to bond her laterals. The only thing that doesn't count is the bond and the debond. But again, no seps, no recepts, no impressions, no scans, none of that. At the end of the debond, we take a scan for her retainers. But during treatment, there's absolutely none of that. And it is just an amazing experience. And if you look at the changes, uh, it's, it's almost hard to believe that this is what we achieve with just some braces and wires. It almost looks like it's too easy. It's like, that, that just can't be, Mike. It just can't be. But it is. And if I also were to tell you, and mom will reiterate this in the video, the patient completely stopped mouth breathing and snoring. Completely stopped. I'm going to talk more about that at the end and, and how that all ties in. But just by talking for talking about this patient, she stopped. And you can see it in her before and after pictures, the magnitude of these changes. You don't even have to be an orthodontist or have a dental background to look at this child and know it's a completely different human. I mean, forget about the teeth for a second. Just look at the eyes, the health of the gingiva, the change in the shape of the face, the positioning of the tongue. It's more forward and anteriorly now that it has space in the oral cavity. This means it's no longer blocking the oropharynx and impeding nasal breathing. It's all tied together. Here's her maxillary arch before and after. You can see the tremendous change across the anterior third. And I'm actually in a moment going to show you some measurements that show this a little more closely. Here's her mandibular arch. I apologize for the angle of that post-treatment picture. I'm such a stickler on pictures, but uh, sometimes clinicians still take ones that... Uh, that aren't, that aren't what they're supposed to take, but um, I apologize for that. But you can still get the idea of just what a tremendous change we achieved in this patient's arch form. It doesn't even look like the same patient. And you can also see that we got the space where we needed it, the anterior and middle thirds. Here's the molar width pre and post treatment showing 3.11 millimeters of expansion across the sixes and nice uprighting of the mandibular molars. You'll also notice if you look uh, in the palatal area, the significant increase in oral volume and space for the tongue. And here's the width across the upper D's. It's double that of the sixes. You have twice the expansion across the upper D's that you have across the upper sixes. Try to do that with an RPE. I, I can't. I mean, it, it's just, and if you do, it's just kind of luck the way it turns out, but you can't predictably get that. With braces and wires, you'll predictably get this all the time. 
And then look at that change in the palatal shape. Look at the shape of her palate and the palatal vault pre and post treatment. Can you look at that and say we didn't get osseous change? Of course we did. We completely remodeled the bone. Part of it, as I said, occurs because of the braces and the wires generating that expansion force. But once the other part is once that tongue can position itself in a more ideal location, it helps push, put pressure on the palate and form and shape it. It's exactly what A.C. Holtzman knew and published on 100 years ago, almost back in 1928. And it's what Moss and Enloe were talking about as well. Remember, form follows function. Form follows function. Let's take a look at the comparison or pans. Look at that space for the permanent teeth, especially the threes. I just didn't see this with any regularity when I was treating these cases with rapid expansion and lower expansion with a hyrax. And I can almost guarantee that in a case like this, those maxillary threes would not have had sufficient room. Remember, she only needed three millimeters of expansion on the molars. So do you mean to tell me if we expanded her with an RPE three millimeters? Let's say we went four, five even, right? If we wanted to allow for some relapse, you're telling me we would have gotten that type of arch perimeter gain and that type of gain across the, the primary canines to allow that much space for the permanent canines to descend? There's no way. Of course we wouldn't have. Let's take a look at our adenoids pretreatment. We knew that. We knew they were enlarged from what we saw in the last podcast. And here they are post-treatment. Where'd they go? For those of you on audio, <laughs> they're not there anymore. <laughs> it, it's like magic. I mean, you, you, when you, it's so much fun. I love taking the, looking at and calling up that post-treatment um, CBCT. And in the course, the course on the D-bond and retention, I actually go into how to do that, how to look at the case <clears throat> with the patient there quickly, review the cone beam, know how to explain, know whether that patient went to the ENT or allergist and what your discussions were at the beginning of treatment. There's little ways you can kind of cheat that and little hacks for, for putting that in the chart in specific spots so you can quickly reference it at the D-Bond conference and then explain it to the patient and parent in the D-Bond conference and pull those images up side by side and say, look at the change. And you want to talk about creating raving fans. You want to talk about creating people that go out and scream from the rooftops what you do and how unique you and your practice are. That'll do it. And remember, she didn't see the ENT or the allergist. This is one of the ones that I said, we'll see how it goes with expansion, see how you respond, and or said to mom, see how she responds, meaning the daughter. And if she doesn't get space or if she doesn't get clearance and she's still struggling breathing, well, then we'll make the referral to our medical colleagues as needed. Because again, I've learned from working with my ENT and allergy colleagues that this isn't a case of severity that they would have wanted to see initially. They would have wanted me to address the intraoral issues before they took action in the nasal passageway or with the lymphoid tissue. And as we know too, you could say, Mike, yeah, the lymphoid tissue shrinks as they get older. Yeah, but it doesn't begin to involute until they start to approach adolescence. So, and you'll see, you know, in that case, you mean to tell me if you were to look at, take this patient, right? Here's a side-by-side -side comparison, emphasizing how amazing the change was. Do you really think this would be what her images would look like one year after the new patient exam? Had we treated her with the traditional method of extractions or space maintenance or just wa wishful watching? No way. No way. Of course it wouldn't have. It's just, it, it. It, it, you have to, it's almost hard to believe. You have to see it to believe it. And here are her nasal passageways and sinuses before and after treatment. Notice how the hypertrophy improved and the right maxillary sinus is now much larger. It's because she's using it. She can breathe through her nose. So she's using her sinuses and nasal passageways for what they were designed to do, which is filter and purify the air and prepare it and humidify it and prepare it to go into the lungs. We are designed to be nasal breathers, not mouth breathers. And so you say to me, Mike, how do you retain this, right? Now, okay, you've done all this. Now you're going to throw these big bulky, bulky uh, retainers in. Nope. Here's what we use, S6C+. That's it. Works like a charm. And I'll teach you again exactly how to make these and how to build them and how the, what the protocol is for how long they wear full-time versus part-time in the courses on the doc website. So now that you've seen all this, the next question is, is, is it stable? Okay, yeah, and that's a great question. Well, let's see how she looked a year into retention. Not bad, right? How many of your RPE cases look this good a year out? How many look this good one year out? Not many of mine did. And notice how beautifully aligned the incisors have remained. Think about how blocked out and crooked everything was in the beginning. 
and her smile. This is pre-treatment and post uh, and during retention. So we're talking two years apart here. Can you honestly say this is what this patient would look like? She would be thriving this much had we just done space maintenance or serial extractions or waited and watched. If this is your child or your grandchild, which would you prefer for them? True story, when I was making this slide, uh, it was a while back because I was actually building the free course for the doc website. My teenage daughter, one of my daughters walked in uh, to my office and, and saw the picture on the computer. And she, she goes, is that the same person? And that's, kids recognize this. So if you just want to take the psychosocial side, kids look at the ki- child on the left differently than they look at the child on the right. This is so beneficial for these kids. It is so powerful and it is so life changing. The treatment that we provided and that you can and will provide will change these kids' lives in so many ways and for the better. You address the malocclusion, you improve her airway patency, you eliminated the mouth breathing and snoring, you improved her performance in school, and you helped her socially. But don't take my word for it. I think it's much more valuable to hear it right from mom. And mom, we were talking about her breathing and um, if you want to tell me a little bit about how she was breathing before treatment. Prior to it, she was a mouth breather. I would hear her snoring at night. Sometimes I would go in her room and try and listen to her. She was having true apnea. Mm-hmm. Um, and I hear her it a little bit, but mostly it was just snoring and mm-hmm. kind of like noisy breathing. She was pretty restless. So the sleeper, she'd be all over the bed. And then when you asked me how it was going, I honestly forgot that that's <laughs> what she was doing because she sleeps soundly now and doesn't get up in the middle of the night and has, you know, become a very quiet sleeper. So that's awesome. Yeah. And that's uh, we were also said you're mentioning about the challenge that you probably would have faced with an expander uh, turning it at night and with you working later, that might have been a hard thing to do, too. Yeah. So I work till midnight, three nights a week, and I know that she tends to have some more sensory issues than, you know, some other kids and would have had a challenge with us doing anything in her mouth. So it probably would have been at least a two person job. (laughs) And being that I'm not home three nights a week, I figured it would be, you know, done twice a week and probably not even done the other three Mm -hmm. nights because it just wouldn't have been possible. And I can only imagine the tears and drama that would have incurred (laughs) in my night trying to do it. So it was great to not have to. And would you say this was pretty much set it and forget it? Like once we built the system, it it was amazing. It was amazing. She had mild discomfort for the first two days. And then one other time during the entire treatment, again, she had, I think like a day and a half where she took Motrin twice, mm-hmm. but then was like, no, I'm fine. Mm-hmm. Ate everything was fine. Like didn't even have to be concerned about it the entire experience. Yes. It was really great. That's awesome. Well, that's why we do it. And like we said, that picture of the eyes, that uh, that tells the whole story is uh, the difference. And I love that. That's kind of the thing I've noticed that uh, you can't really quantify, but you just look at the patient's eyes before and after when they were breathing not the right way. And then you do this and you get them breathing right. It just It's just night and day for them. So cool. Well, thank you for sharing that. You did great. I'm proud of you for getting through everything. <laughs> cool. Never gets old hearing that. Never gets old. It's just so awesome. It's just so awesome. And it's it's so powerful. It's so... Days can be tough, right? What we do is a grind. And man, when you have patients that you change like this and you have parents that appreciate you and what you do that much, it fills my tank. And I don't know, I can't speak for everybody, but I know most of us went into this to help people and to make a difference in our patients' lives. And uh, I know that was my uh, impetus for, for wanting to go into this profession. Uh, and there's nothing quite like it when you see these patients and parents respond the way they do. So as we close, I just want to say that I know change is difficult. I also know that as orthodontists, we are very dogmatic and we tend to find a technique or approach that we like, that we learned, and we stick to it. After all, it probably works, right? I mean, when I was treating these patients with turnkey expanders, upper and lower, I mean, it worked, worked, but is it what's best for them? Is it the best I could do? It wasn't. And that's, I think, the the hard part about orthodontics, right? Even the things that aren't ideal typically kind of (laughs) work. So it's hard to make us want to change because like, well, what I'm doing works, but could it work better? Could you find something that would work better? That the disappointing part is in our profession, I think we become so dogmatic and I've seen this, I'm going to tell you a story in a second, that we shun anything that falls outside of our comfort zone. 
it's a bit of a protective mechanism and, and probably comes from a place of insecurity, truthfully. Uh, and that's not a, a criticism of anybody. It's just, it just, I mean, I know it myself. There were things I went and saw, would go to lectures during my career and I'd be like, no, no, there's no way, or, or that's not going to work, or, or that's, you know, doesn't have the data to support it or whatever it was. I, I found an excuse to rationalize my be- behavior and feelings um, so that I didn't have to change. But when we shunning any, everything that or anything that falls outside of our comfort zone restricts our growth and development. Because remember, outside your comfort zone is where growth occurs. I also want to be clear that I never, and I don't want you to ever, anyone who, who follows me or watches my content or takes my courses, to tell patients and parents that interceptive treatment fixes airway problems or that interceptive treatment helps kids breathe better. And you do this, if you get braces as a kid, you're going to breathe better or you won't snore or you'll do better in school or nocturnal enuresis will go away. I've never told a patient or parent that if they go through phase one treatment to expand their arches, these things will just happen, okay? It's very important to understand that. Instead, what you should do is simply explain that there's a problem, so take them through the problem, right? You know the arches are narrow, constricted, the tongue doesn't have space, so on and so forth, everything we've been through. And when you take that approach to the diagnosis, Okay, that allows you to detect these underlying problems more than just what's going on with the teeth. So it allows you to then make the appropriate referrals to your medical colleagues, as we already talked about, and then treat the etiology of the constricted arches by using a minimally invasive and comfortable technique to develop the arches. Oftentimes when you do this, you will also see improvements in things like airway patency and improvement of mouth breathing and elimination of snoring. But again, you just tell them, you, this is the problem the patient has. They have narrow arches, they have crowding, they don't have room for their tongue, so on and so forth. By going in and making space in the mouth, normalizing the width, putting the, the arches at the width that they are supposed to be, it will make room for the tongue that has been shown to help airway and help eliminate the snoring and mouth breathing, but that's not a guarantee, okay? Really, really important. So often people who doubt this and question this approach say, oh, you know, you're going out there saying, put braces on every seven-year-old, saying that it helps every seven-year-old breathe better. Absolutely not. Unacceptable. And anybody who does that was not taught by me. I would never subscribe to that theory. Educate your patient and their parents on what the problems are. Make the appropriate referrals to your medical colleagues and address the orthodontic issues in front of you. Take those narrow V-shaped arches and normalize them. And when you do, you will oftentimes see amazing changes occur. I also never promise that arch development improves airway or solves their child's breathing problems. What I say is, as we normalize it, Right, which again, it's a, this is a good thing. We're going to fix a problem that they have with their teeth and their mouth. It helps the tongue come forward, as I mentioned. Then they can hopefully breathe better through their nose. If you use a CBCT, and I go into this in the course, I uh, teach you an airway tour that you can take. It's actually very easy to educate the parents on this. They get it when you show them that cone beam and show them what air looks like going through a 3D image and you show the obstructions that it finds and you show how you can at least maybe help one of those by orthodontically by getting the tongue more space and you can refer to your ENT and or um, allergy colleagues to address others, parents get it. That's where the parents are like, yeah, why didn't someone else tell me this? And we'll go over that more in a minute. The nice part is it also makes more space for the teeth and decreases the chances that teeth get impacted or extracted. And that's very different from saying braces on seven-year-olds solve and cure airway problems. I also want to be clear that I only use this approach when arches are narrow or constricted. And I do not advocate expanding arches that don't have a transverse discrepancy. Remember, it's not the expansion that solves the problem. It's normalizing the width of narrow arches. That's one issue I, I take with the white paper from the AAO in 2019. And I keep saying this, but in my courses, I go into this in much more detail. But that's one issue I have with that. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't look at 
patients who have, in the way we're looking at them, right? That if you take patients with narrow arches and you develop their arches, and then you're able to see that they have more space for the tongue and teeth and et cetera, as we've reviewed, that can those patients end up breathing better, especially if you coordinate care with your ENT and otolaryngology, ENT, excuse me, and allergy colleagues as needed. Okay. It's very different. They just looked at as does expansion solve airway problems? Okay. No, just expanding in itself isn't going to necessarily expand airway problems, especially because the patient might not be narrow. I mean, if the patient is, doesn't have a transverse discrepancy, what are you going to do? Tip the teeth out of the buccal bone? Are you going to try to expand them beyond what they should be expanded? And I think that's where this approach gets a bad rap because people take patients who are, even, who are young, who maybe seven, eight years old, don't have a significant transverse discrepancy or one at all. And they throw expanders in these patients and they blow the arches out and they say, because of that, you're going to breathe better. Well, no, if they don't have a transverse discrepancy orthodontically, we have no business making them overly wide. Okay. If you don't detect airway impediments in your diagnosis, then that patient needs to have a sleep study conducted by a sleep physician. And I mean, you get some patients who don't have a transverse discrepancy, but have obstructive airways. They have enlarged lymphoid tissue. They have hypertrophied nasal passageways, uh, hypertrophied turbinates and obstructed nasal, nasal passageways. So you make the appropriate referral to the ENT and or the allergist. You don't have to go send them for a sleep study. You know they snore. Send them to the ENT or allergist, right? But if they don't have any of those things, they have no obstruction of the airway that you can detect on cone beam. They have no, no transverse discrepancy intraorally. They have plenty of space for their tongue. They don't have macroglossia or something that's, that's out of the ordinary, right? These are not patients you, you go in and expand. But I can tell you that in over 10 years and seeing thousands of patients, many, tens of thousands of patients, I had one. Yes, one patient who actually fell into that category that had broad arches, no obstruction of the uh, pharyngeal airway, nasal passageways, nothing. Totally looked normal on the cone beam. Everything looked fine, yet they still were snoring and mouth breathing. One. Again, there's going to be outliers in anything, but compare that to the thousands of patients I saw who had airway problems and had narrow arches. And that just further substantiates the claim that constricted arches and airway obstruction run hand in hand. And as I said, we've known this for like a hundred years. This isn't new. Why we question this and doubt this still, the data are there to support this theory. It's interesting that we continue to refute it. And when you take this approach to patient care, You'll notice this. You'll see it. The light bulb will go off. And if you're anything like me, you're actually going to have a hard time believing that you didn't make this connection before. And I had that aha moment. I was like, when I first, it was a point at which I said, you know, how come I didn't know this? Why did I not realize this? Why didn't I learn this? Why aren't we teaching this? And that's why it's my mission to go out and teach this and educate my colleagues so that in the end we can help more patients. You know, when I first started using this approach, I'd actually tell parents, that, and I'd have, we'd put it in the informed consent that the patient may end up needing expanders, but if they were okay with it, I'd give a shot to this new way I was doing it with braces and wires and see, see how it goes. So many patient parents are like, yeah, anything to keep those torture devices out of my kid's mouth and I'm game. Uh, also let's face it. Kids aren't exactly getting more resilient when it comes to their tolerance of things intraorally clinically uh, over the past years. I definitely saw a change in, during my, my clinical practice years of, of, of that grittiness of the kids and how much they can tolerate in the chair. So it's not fun putting expanders. And I actually think that's a big part of why some orthodontists shun phase one and try to stay away from it. Because if you're using expanders or quad helices and all these appliances, headgear, lip bumpers, let's face it, those aren't fun for patients and parents and team members. They're not efficient. Uh, they don't generate revenue because your time in your clinic and you know, people say, oh, people do phase one to make more money. We'll go into that in, in, in other discussions. But the point is most phase one is not a profit maker, a profit generator at all, at all. I mean, when I started doing phase one, the way I did it with turnkey expanders, I lost money <laughs> big time. It wasn't until I started doing it with braces and wires that I actually figured out that it could be profitable too. Um, but I kept at it because even though I was losing money on it, I knew deep down it was the right thing to do for my patients. I knew it was better to expand their arches, even though I was doing it kind of the wrong way, so to speak, with expanders, um, than to pull teeth or do space maintenance because, again, that wasn't treating the etiology. And I knew it even before I had a better way to do it. So because I wasn't 100% sure it would work, I wanted to be upfront. I've always been upfront with my patients and, and their families 
I would say this is a newer thing I'm trying. Um, it, I don't know if it's going to work on, on your patient, on your child, but I'm willing to try and I won't charge you for it. If it doesn't work, we get four to six months in, we'll take the braces off and put expanders in. People were fine with that approach. They wanted to try anything, as I said, to keep expanders out of their child's mouth. So we tried it. Guess how many times in thousands of cases over 10 years and 12 years, I needed to uh, revert course, remove the braces and put an expander in. Guess how many? For those of you on audio, holding up a zero. Never. I never once did. And what I did is as I went on, year at, you know, kind of month after month or months after months, I would push that envelope further. So in the beginning, I kind of said it to everybody. And then I realized, okay, oh, well, this type of case, I definitely know I can fix with braces and wires, but I'll only say it if they've got, if they're this much more narrow, then this much more narrow. And then it became, well, if they have a unilateral crossbite, I'll say it. Then it became, well, if they have a bilateral crossbite, I'll say it. And then it became, I didn't even have to say it. And so after a few years, I just stopped even saying it and wasn't part of our informed consent anymore because I was so confident that I was able to fix these cases without, again, if they are young, they have to be in that seven to nine age range, maybe 10, you can get away with it. So if you're skeptical and hesitant to take the leap, I have a challenge for you. Try it. That's it. Just try it. Try using this approach and see how it works. What do you have to lose, right? Think about it. If it's your daughter, your niece, your granddaughter, wouldn't you want for them what I just showed you we did for this young girl? Worst case, you take the braces off and pull teeth or maintain space like you were going to do anyway. If you're worried about the patient feeling overcharged, don't charge them to do it. Do it on a family member and just give it as a courtesy or, or not even a family member and just say, I'm not going to charge you for this. This is something I'm in the process of learning and working on. And I'll go ahead and do it at no cost. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, we'll go back to the traditional approach and then talk about what the cost would be for that. Best case, you realize there's a new and superior way to approach the interceptive treatment of your pre-adolescent patients that can transform their lives. Once that helps you change lives in ways you never imagined possible, you will never look at interceptive treatment the same way again. However, as a caveat, I do recommend you learn how to do this correctly before jumping in with both feet. I have created that five-part series on this technique that covers everything from diagnosis and treatment planning to communicating with patients and parents about the technique to bonding to adjustments to debond to retention. It's actually a total of 26 and three quarters hours of CE, and it will literally guide you through from A to Z this entire process to set you up for success. If you just go in and throw braces on a seven-year-old patient, next time you're, you see one that presents looking like these patients present, you're going to encounter challenges and, and likely have failures that you just don't have to go through. Uh, I, I know, I did it, right? I didn't have anyone guiding me through it, and I had to figure it out the hard way, and I made mistakes. I did. I, it's, it, it, when I show the cases now, it looks easy because I perfected the process, but there's a lot of, of, of nuance to it, and that's what I, I really want to make sure you understand. So it's like any, and then also you you'll, you'll won't think it will work, right? If you do it and you try it and you're not really educated, it's not going to work the right way and you're going to end up thinking the approach is not uh, successful. You Just like anything, you need to learn the proper approach and technique first, then you can implement it in your practice. If you still have questions, <clears throat> excuse me, after taking the courses, feel free to enroll in a doc coaching session with me and I'll be happy to guide through you through whatever questions you have to help you succeed. I also want to prepare you for the fact that it may not be easy at first. Change is hard and paradigm shifts are even harder. Number one, you need to get your team on board and the courses talk about how to do that. You need to educate your team. They're going to look at you. My team looked at me when I said, we're going to use braces in phase one instead of expanders. And they were like, my TC had been with, she moved, her husband was in the ser uh, uh, services and he was, a, he moved around from state to state. And so, um, she had gone, worked at multiple different practices. And when I told her this, she's like, wait, what? That doesn't work. And, and so you have to educate your team so that they understand the science behind this, understand the logic behind this and the approach that you're taking. Don't just go doing it without your team on board. But I have to be honest, I lost a few starts when I began doing this. And uh, it really it was because it wasn't the norm. And when patients heard about it, some went back to their primary care dentist or um, and they went to ask about this or they went for another opinion uh, and they were told that 
this doesn't work. There's no way that works. That's how uneducated we are as a profession about this. We literally tell patients that this doesn't work. And I, as much as I kind of fault the, the colleagues for that, I don't know. I mean, they haven't seen it work. So why would they think it works? Everything we've been taught, even though the literature is there and the data are there to show that this does work, they haven't been taught it. So you don't know what you don't know. And the reason I know this is what would happen is because parents would tell us that this is what was said to them, that they were told this wouldn't work. And some told us that and ended up still starting. And some called and told my TC or my patient coordinator, no, you know, we were told this isn't going to work. So we don't, it's, we don't want to try it. So you did, I did lose a couple cases initially, but that changed very quickly. One story I want to tell you, there's this kid, I love the kid, stories the kids tell. This kid, the kids, I'll tell you, they, they say it like it is. There's a seven-year-old in my chair for new patient exam. I go through everything, the diagnostics, and recommend phase one with bra- braces and wires to expand and develop his arches. The patient says, mom, I like this way much better. Why did the other doctor say it doesn't work and can mess up my mouth? It, true story. It was hysterical. My TC and I start cracking up. And the mom, I mean, it's the mom's face. You can just picture it. She's just like, she turns red and she's like, um, yeah. And she kind of tried to hide it. I said, that's okay. I said, tell me a little bit more about it. You know, I, I, I would like to know what, what were you told? Uh, and mom proceeded to tell me that another orthodontist for an opinion they went said that um, they knew they were coming to see me and they assumed that I would be doing it without expanders. So to sort of proactively protect themselves, um, they told mom that if they treated it, if I, if they had me treat it with the way I did it without expanders and braces and wires, it would harm the patient. And the receptionist who actually was a doctor's wife called them afterwards and told them that there's no research to support what I was doing and I was harming patients. True story. So I actually contacted the colleague. Um, happened to be at a meeting coming up like about a week after that. So I was like, I'm going to just pull him aside and talk to him. And I did. Asked if this was true. I said, I'm, you know, be fair. I'm not accusing you of anything, but this is what I was told. And I just want to ask you if this is true, if this really happened. And he actually, to his credit, he admitted it. Not, not really at first, but after I pressed him, he admitted it and told me what I was doing was wrong. I asked him if he even knew what I was actually doing and he admitted he didn't, but he said, I don't need to know because using full braces in phase one for any reason is malpractice. I told him he's free to agree with my approach. Clearly he doesn't have to agree with me, but lying to a patient and their family and smearing a colleague is professional misconduct and to never, ever do it again. Or my next call would be to the office of professional discipline to report him. See, I take my reputation very seriously. I care deeply about my patients and the quality of my results in my work. And I wasn't going to let someone who was completely naive to what I was doing, which is fine if he doesn't want to know what I'm doing, but don't make false accusations to patients. But I tell this story because it exemplifies the point that you may face some blowback when you first take this approach. Really though, I found out and I came to realize this, it was just jealousy from colleagues because they're stuck doing it the old way and you're moving forward. You're progressing, you're improving. And in the end, you're taking patients from them. And that's not why you do it, but my practice exploded. People didn't want the old way. They wanted the new way. Change is hard, especially for orthos. And so often we mock change instead of deep trying to understand the change. So after a year or two of taking this approach, word started to spread in my community. My technique was the talk of soccer and lacrosse at soccer and lacrosse fields, as well as on social media in a bunch of the moms groups. And we know because they told us this. I literally had parents calling and saying, we heard Dr. Mike can do expansion without those awful expanders. Is that true? Or I want expansion without expanders for my son. Or I don't want those torture devices in my kid. I heard Dr. Mike can do it without them. And again, it's not that I don't use expanders. Of course, there's a time and a place for expanders. It's that I'm not using them in these young pre-adolescent patients in phase one. And because my colleagues scoffed at the concept, they didn't want to try it because at that point they had dug in and they were resistant to the change. So the more my practice grew and the more I became known as the only one in the area to deliver this unique and superior service and approach to interceptive treatment, the more it grew. I was the only one who could do it without those awful torture devices that parents we've all heard describe expanders. People drove from hours away to have their kids treated in my practice. And again, while that's not why I did this, I mean, again, at first I took a hit for it. I did this because I was searching for a better way to treat my patients. It really was amazing to see how it played out. 
And if I ever see you at a meeting, I can tell you a lot more stories about things from offices and patients and things that were said about me uh, for trying this. But it never bothered me because I knew I was doing it for the right reasons. And that's also what motivated me. Those comments from colleagues motivated me even more to go out and teach it to the rest of the world and to my colleagues. Because that's why when someone mocks something like that or is that defensive against something, there's typically a reason why. It means you're onto something. And I realized we need to approach patient care in a new way. And that's the paradigm shift. So I want to finish by asking you a question. Why did you become an orthodontist? For me, it was to help change people's lives. And I can honestly tell you that I've changed more lives with this treatment than any other treatment I've provided. I'm very proud of my work. And I've had some amazing functional aesthetic transformations throughout my career. But nothing compares to when you help a kid who is struggling and you improve their quality of life. I mean, really improve it. Nothing compares. I would routinely have moms break down in tears in the consultation when I would ask the airway questions that I teach in the course and I'd uncover that airway issue that no other doctor had diagnosed so that they had, had been ignored. The parent would say, I knew it. I knew something was wrong. But the pediatrician just says she's a stuffy kid and never does anything about it. Some parents even said they asked to be referred to an ENT or allergist. The pediatrician refused, saying it wasn't necessary. Think about that if you're a parent. And then there's that moment you're asking those airway questions and you see the parents looking at you or at each other if it's mom and dad sometimes. Like, How the heck did he know this? How did you know this from looking at her teeth? Some even say it. Some ask, why didn't anyone else figure this out? Why isn't everyone doing this? You'll hear it all the time. And I would just answer that, unfortunately, pediatricians aren't very airway aware and they uh, have more of a limited knowledge of the teeth. And for orthodontists, it's not really how we were trained. So it's not how most of us practice. I also never put down people who did it differently. Never. If they said they were recommended pulling teeth, I say, you know, there's different ways to do it. I don't recommend that approach. That's one way, but it's not the way I recommend. And I'd explain why. If they came in and said, so-and-so said, you need to use expanders and that you can't do it your way. I'd say, you can use expanders. I use them on many, many patients. They work, but I figured a way, I found a way that I feel works better for, mo for reasons, you know, ABC. So it's not, I don't need to disparage my colleagues. If they want to do it differently, have at it. I'm very proud of the way I developed and I can prove why it's a superior way. So this is power, powerful stuff and it goes way beyond straight teeth. It really does. We're more than just two straighteners. We're physicians of the oral cavity and we have tremendous knowledge in the arena of craniofacial growth and development. Let's use that knowledge to improve our patient's quality of life. Ironically, this became the motivation for me to devote my life to teaching my colleagues how to take this approach, as I mentioned before. The paradigm must shift. Your patients deserve it. In the next episode, we'll hear from my colleague and friend, Dr. Jeff Rothenberg. Jeff is an awesome orthodontist practicing in Aventura, Florida, and I actually taught him this approach and technique years ago. He'll explain to you what it was like implementing this approach into his practice and how it has impacted his practice ever since. Thanks so much and have a great day, everyone. Thank you for watching this episode of the Doc Podcast. Be sure to visit theorthocoach.com to get access to CE courses or schedule a private one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me. And remember to join the Doc community on Locals for more great content designed to help you succeed both personally and professionally. Just go to Locals and search for the Doc community. You can also find Doc on Instagram at, at the ortho coach. And remember, you have the power to do amazing things.